Good morning. I'm, I'm very glad to have this opportunity. Um, you know, it was, uh, what, back in June or July, I guess, July, August. It's been a while now. Um, last time I got to talk to you all, and I'm better that, you know, now I get to look out and see some faces. I guess last time, it, you know, we're kind of shut down here for, <laughs> with COVID, and um, like Pastor Dan was saying, you know, this was uh, an opportunity. You know, he approached me about like, hey, you want to talk on a, a, a section of Acts? And, um, you know, I really, I really gravitated uh, toward this section, Acts 15. Um, and, and one of the reasons, or a few of the reasons why, is just looking at uh, the church and what they're dealing with right here, um, that it's a, it's a core issue that they were dealing with, with false teaching. They're also dealing with unity between Jewish and Gentile believers, and there's kind of this whole new thing going on, and they don't really know how to take care of it. And so that's why I kind of really like this section of, of Scripture, and, I, and it really speaks to me. And I feel that also it has a lot of relevance to today. Well, all, all Scripture has relevance today, but this section right here, um, it, I can really see how it, it can really be relevant to today. So, um, <clears throat> have y'all been enjoying the series in Acts so far? I have. Yeah, and uh, I know for me, just seeing, you know, we, we see that in the Gospels, we see Jesus' ministry, we see him teaching, we see him investing in his disciples. And now in Acts, we see the founding of the church at Pentecost, we see God's Spirit anointing His believers and them just going out and fulfilling His commands and bringing the gospel. And just looking at, and what we're going to be looking at today is where we have the gospel's gone out. We have Jewish believers who are primarily where the church started, right? And then um, now we have uh, some doctrinal issues coming up, right? Um, and so, we're going to be looking at right today, Acts 15, verses 1 through 21. And one of the doctrinal issues that comes up is, you know, we have these Gentile believers, and do they just come to faith just like us? Do they, do they need to be Jewish first? I mean, if we're all Jewish and then we become believers, do they have to be Jewish first? Do they have to, you know, go through circumcision? Do they have to follow the law do they need to follow all the dietary restrictions? So we look at that. Uh, we have false teachers that are going around, uh, you know, and they're really, really causing a lot of problems. And so they, they address that. And then, like I was saying already, there, there's this issue of, you know, how do we overcome, you know, these, these differences? There's not only just an ethnic difference, right? But there's also kind of a historical difference, a, a different mindset where, you think, you know, you think, you know, sometimes it's hard to get, you know, to understand people who are a little different than you, but when you have a whole mindset of, you know, we were God's chosen people and y'all were not, but now y'all are getting added to the kingdom and, you know, what does that look like and, and how do we, you, you're, follow, you're living in freedom and Christian liberty and we're still following uh, the law, you know. So, you know, we can't have dinner together, right? Because, you know, I want to eat this, you can't eat that. Um, and so we, we look at kind of these things and how the early church addresses it, all right? And one of the reasons this is so important also, back to the grace issue, is, look, if, if we look at any other doctrinal issue, right, there's been like seven church councils throughout history. We have the first church council right here recorded for us in, in, in Acts. Um, one of the, the doctrinal issue, if we have our doctrine of salvation wrong, okay, you know, there's other things we can disagree with. You know, there's people we can call brothers and sisters in Christ. We could disagree on, on things maybe like baptism or maybe, you know, different way of church government and, and different stuff like that. But if we have our doctrine of salvation wrong, if, if somebody is, is believing a gospel that's not real, that doesn't have the power to save, is there anything else that matters? I mean, if you miss that, I mean, 
then what? I mean, but you have everything else right. Well, like, well, they have the same doctrine of the Trinity. They believe the same thing about God, but they believe they're saved through works. Or they will have faith, but I also have to earn that grace, okay? That's where we're going to get into today is basically, you know, maybe in the early church, it was, you know, you have a system of works, by following the law, through circumcision, through dietary restrictions, through following the Sabbath, all right? Today, we maybe look a little differently, and we'll get into that later, so, all right. <clears throat> and, and just a little bit of background here before we, we dive into what's going on. So, the church, you know, we, we talked about being founded at Pentecost, all right? Um, the gospel is being preached. What did Jesus tell them? You know, it's Jerusalem then throughout Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, right? So the church starts in Jerusalem, all right? There's preaching going around in Judea, and then, you know, around Samaria, all right? Christ said he was going to build his church. That's what he's doing, all right? Um, now, as Samaritans, we know, we know if we, we read, you know, the, new, the Gospels and stuff, we know historically— there were some issues with between Jews and Samaritans. Samaritans were uh, kind of the descendants of Jews who were left uh, behind during the exile. They intermarried with Gentiles, and there was kind of a division between them, all right? Um, however, you know, Samaritans had a shared heritage um, with, it, with, with the Jews, all right? So they believed in the same God. They have some of the same customs. So for Samaritans to come into the church— you know, it was a little bit of a thing, but, you know, they, they were open, and they at least had, uh, you know, a similar background, all right? Uh, then we have Gentile believers, okay? So early on, earlier on in Acts, we, we get to see a few Gentiles who come to faith, right? Uh, we have the Ethiopian eunuch. He would have been a Gentile, right? And Philip shows up. Uh, while, he, while the Ethiopian eunuch is, is reading Isaiah 53, explains it to him, you know, the eunuch believes, he's baptized, all right? Uh, then we have, uh, in Acts chapter 10, we have Cornelius. We have Peter, who has the vision, right? Well, Cornelius has a vision too, right? Which is cool. And then Peter has a vision. And, you know, we have the sheep come down with all the, you know, unclean animals, the things that Peter says, no, no, Lord, I would never eat those. No, no. And God tells him what? What I've called, what I've... Uh, declared clean or pure, you don't declare, you know, common or unclean, all right? So, uh, and so you have Cornelius getting the gospel. Cornelius has his family there and his, uh, you know, some friends and stuff. They hear the gospel. They believe. They receive the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And then, um, and they, you know, they're like, hey, is there any reason we can't baptize them? They receive the Holy Spirit just like we did God has opened the kingdom of God to the Gentiles as well. All right, so then that brings us, you know, we have uh, some, issues, some things happen. The persecution within the church, the believers in Jerusalem start to spread out, you know. They have to get away from, from the persecution. Uh, God uses this opportunity to plant more churches around there, okay? So now you have believers spreading out everywhere. Um, Paul and Barnabas uh, in Acts chapter 13, all right? Paul being one of the big persecutors of the early church, now he's a believer. So Paul and Barnabas have been commissioned to take the gospel to the Gentiles, all right? So then Paul and Barnabas, um, they go on their, their first missionary journey, or Paul's first missionary journey. You know, they, they start a church, they have a church in Antioch. They use Antioch as kind of a home base, then they go throughout uh, the Antioch area and Galatia and Cyprus, and they plant churches there, and then they go back around and they appoint elders. We talked about that like uh, a couple weeks ago, I think. And then we just kind of go in and really investing, and you have more and more Gentiles who are coming into the kingdom, more and more Gentiles who are believing. And, um, I mean, this is amazing news. This is great news that God is being glorified, that God is working among the Gentiles, all right? But then what about the Jewish believers? You know, they, we talked about there was kind of a, a different mindset towards, towards Gentiles, and 
Um, we know that Jews generally consider going into a Gentile's house would make you defiled or unclean, okay? So they have kind of this idea. God gave the law to the Jews, the ceremonial law, and we'll get into the different types in a minute, to kind of keep them separate, not isolated, but separate from other nations around them to keep them devoted to him. All right, and that's where we get the ideas of, you know, dietary restrictions, the Sabbath, well, the Sabbath is other reasons, but the idea of different things that they had to do, different customs that set them apart uh, to keep them, you know, kind of separated, but not, you know, so they couldn't really intermingle and things like that. And so a lot of this stuff carries carries over into the church here, where we have issues of fellowship between Jews and Gentiles, all right? And so Jerusalem, you know, that's probably primarily going to be Jewish, but you have different communities all around this area, uh, especially in Galatia and stuff, where you have, in the same town, you have Jewish believers and you have Gentile believers, okay? Um, and this is what's commonly referred to as the diaspora. There's lots of Jewish people who are kind of spread around the world. And, you know, when Paul and Barnabas are going to different towns, First, what are they normally doing? They're going to the synagogue first, all right? Sometimes some of the people will listen to them. Sometimes they show them the door. <laughs> and then what do they do? Then they go to the Gentiles, right? So, uh, and one of the things to think of here is, you know, now we, we know more. We have, you know, Scripture to look at. The Jewish believers, they didn't stop being Jewish when they became a Christian, Okay. You know, this is part of their ethnic identity. This is part of their customs. This is how they grew up, all right? Again, back to the law. The law was given to them. Uh, it was from God, all right? Now, they, they couldn't keep the law, right? They can't be justified under the law. They're always justified under faith, but they still are following it, okay? Um, even when we look into earlier parts of Acts, we see, you know, uh, the believers are still going to the temple. Um, they're still following festivities and stuff like that. So just because they become believers doesn't mean that they give up on their uh, following the law. Okay, um, <clears throat> Christianity is was viewed basically as a sect of Judaism. Right? It's Christianity is the natural conclusion to Judaism. You have the Old Testament prophecies, the Messiah that's pro, uh, you know promised, the uh, Son of David, you know all these Old Testament prophecies, Messiah. We have this this leading up to it. You know there has to be somebody to come to substitute to take you know to do the atoning work. All right, so Christianity is just kind of like the conclusion of that. So it, you know it's and, and then you also have all the Jewish believers. They were all Jewish first, and then they became a Christian. All right, so, you know, does that mean other Gentiles need to, you know, they need to do the same thing? Do they need to be Jewish and then become a Christian? Is Judaism like kind of like a, a gateway to Christianity? You got to go through this gate first, then you go through Christ to become a Christian. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, and, and then there was also a little bit of a, you know, superiority complex. You know, they could say, see Gentiles as, you know, not being God's chosen people, not being, um, you know, the plus, you know, you got to look at their history too. Jew, Jews absolutely despised idolatry, which was bad. You know, they shouldn't, I mean, they should have that feeling. They have a very bad history with idolatry. You saw in the kingdom of Israel what happened. In Judea, they what, turned away from God, turned to idolatry. God ju put judgment on them, right? He brought in the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They went into exile. They come back. They're like, let's not do that again, okay? <laughs> Didn't work out so good for us last time, right? So they, uh, and then we see, and we, we see this even, um, even throughout the Gospels. We see in Jesus' ministry, who's his, his chief opponents, right? The Pharisees, and the Sadducees somewhat, all right, and they just two normally don't get together, but in the case of going against Jesus, they do, all right, so, um, and you have kind of, you see these Pharisees that have this whole system of legalism built, 
and we're going to get into into some of that in a minute. But they they have this whole system built where you know I wouldn't want to associate with sinners and especially you know Gentiles, ugh, unclean, all that kind of stuff. So, all right. <clears throat> So starting off, just leading up to, to where we're going to start reading here in a second. So Paul and Barnabas, we've already talked about them being commissioned in Acts 13. And they've traveled around Antioch and uh, Galatia and Cyprus. And they, this is their, you know, they've been planting churches. But there's also been kind of an uh, anti-missionary journey going on, all right? Um, and we'll see here that there's this group or group of, you know, people who are... Paul refers to them as the Judaizers, okay? And they've been going to these different churches that Paul and Barnabas have started, these different churches around the area, and they've gone to the Gentiles and they're saying, you're not saved. You need to be circumcised first, all right? So, and you need to follow the laws of Moses. And so, you can imagine quite the ruckus this is making, like, whoa, what's going on here? And, and right here, starting in, in, uh, in verse 1, we have basically the Judaizers have shown up at home base here in Antioch, and Paul and Barnabas are about to throw down with them, all right? So, <laughs> all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start here just reading verses 1 and 2. But some men came down from Judea. And we're teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to a group up to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about the question. All right. So Paul and Barnabas, they refute them. All right. This group, they come from, from Judea. All right. We'll find out later that. They weren't sent by the church. They just kind of took it upon themselves to go up there and straighten these Gentiles out. So, uh, yeah, this is a big issue. Um, these false teachers, you mean think about Jesus talking about sheep or wolves in sheep's clothing, all right? They're there. They're emissaries of Satan. They're there to spread a false gospel. They're there to lead people astray, all right? Uh there's, um, you know, we, they want them to, you know, enter the circumcision, all right? This is a sign of a covenant that was given to Abraham, all right? This is step one to becoming Jewish. You want to become Jewish, you got to get circumcised if you're a man. That's step one. So this is, they're starting them on this path, like, no, no, you got to, you know, salvation's for Jews. You got to get, you know, you got to become Jewish, become saved. And so, you know, obviously, you know, they're like, what are these guys talking about? Um Paul and Barnabas, they, they, you know, handle the debate very well, but there's this realization that these guys, they're going to be traveling around everywhere. This is going to be a bigger issue, right? This is going to be a big issue. They're going to, you know, and we'll see in Galatians, is Paul dealing with this issue over and over again? Um, so this needs to go to Jerusalem. This needs to be settled for the whole church all over the world. Everybody, we need to come to the same conclusion on this, right? <clears throat> these false teachers also I, I like to think of them they took a lot of pride in, in getting people to be Jews all right um, and, it, and it, this just harping back to me when Jesus was really one in uh, Matthew, Matthew 23 calling out the Pharisees for a lot of their hypocrisy he said look woe to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, a pro, uh, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you yourselves are. So, I mean, these people, they are doing evil, all right? They're, they're taking, they want to spread a false gospel. And really, we saw a lot of the Pharisees' problems to begin with in the Gospels is what? Their legalism, their pride, all right? They're not doing things for the glory of God. They're doing things to glorify themselves, right? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so let's uh, pick back up in verse 3, all right? So being sent on their way uh, by the church... They passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, 
describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. All right. And uh, they declared all that God had done with them. Some believers who were among, uh, belonged to the party of the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. All right. So um, Paul and Barnabas, on their way down to Jerusalem, all right, they stopped by uh, some churches in Phoenicia and uh, Samaria, all right? These would be primarily Hellenistic Jews, all right? These are Jews who don't necessarily live in, in Jerusalem or Judea or Galilee, who have a Greek cultural background, but they're Jewish, all right? Uh, these would have been uh, churches planted by Stephen, Philip, Peter, and John. Um, and then also, of course, Samaritans. We know that, that kind of history there between them and Jews. And so these believers, you know, they stop, they spread the word. These guys are overjoyed to hear about all the work um, that God is doing among the Gentiles that uh, Paul and Barnabas tell them about. But when Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas get to Jerusalem, right, um, they're welcomed by the church, right? They've been out for a while. They've been gone for a while. And it, sometimes it's so hard to think about things historically, you know, we can, the communication that exists today, when somebody's across the world, you can still communicate with them, right? If we send out missionaries today, they have ways of communicating with us, all right? They sent Paul and Barnabas off. I'm sure they could have sent letters, but you haven't seen these guys the whole time they've been there. And so, here they come, they're coming back there. You want to hear about everything God's doing. You want to hear about the news. You want to hear about the kingdom of God. And so, you know, they're welcomed. You know, the church is very happy to see them. They want to hear all about it. And then what? Then there's those among the Pharisees that raise up. So these, I want to give these guys a little bit more credit than the false teachers, all right? It, it refers to them at, um, in verse 5, uh, the believers, some, but some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, okay? So it is calling them believers, all right? We do know that while Jesus did have his opponents that were, uh, you know, his opposition were Pharisees, there were a few, all right? Uh, we know of Nicodemus, right, that comes to Jesus in, in John chapter 3, who, you know, he's like, hey, I, there's something different about you. We see the stuff you're doing, What's up, you know, like, and then, of course, Jesus, like, jumps right to it. It's like, you, you want to come see the kingdom of God, you got to be born again. Um, so we know of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was also on the Sanhedrin. He stood up. I don't remember which gospel, but I can, I know that he, do remember that he kind of, like, questioned this whole thing with the trial, all right? Uh, you also have Joseph of Arimathea, who's also a Pharisee. He's the one uh, who went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body him and Nicodemus went and buried Jesus, right? So there were some Pharisees, even though the majority were probably in opposition to Jesus, but we see now that there are some Pharisees who have come to faith in Christ, all right? But we see here that, you know, they're, they're, they're like, you know, sh here's a, there's a big difference between does a Gentile, must a Gentile follow the law? Must a Gentile be circumcised? to be a believer, or should they be circumcised? Should they follow the law? You got to think, they, these people, they've just continued to follow the law because that's all they've, they've done their whole lives. Now they're, they're Christians, they're still doing that. But there's a big difference between must and should, all right? We could say the same thing about baptism. Should you be baptized as a believer? Absolutely, it's a commandment to do so. Must you be baptized to be saved? No. Okay, so and that would be, you know, kind of maybe the same way that they're doing is like, well, they should follow the law. We do it. They should do it. You know, like we take on this burden, this yoke of the law, like it's not fair. Like they don't do it. All right. And we'll, we'll get into how they're going to settle this in a minute. All right. <clears throat> so. Um, oops. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Drop a minute. <clears throat> so, 
So the question at hand, all right, is how do we handle this? All right, we know that the, the, there's going to be a council here in a second, and we're going to have to, to, to settle these issues, all right? Whether or not grace is enough to come to God in grace, right? Or if you have to add to that, following the law, okay? Good works, any sort of ceremony or ritual, right? <clears throat> We know that New Covenant believers now do not need to bear the burden of following ceremonial law. All right, this is, we can, you know, Christ came, he fulfilled the law. Uh, you can also see uh, Corinthians 9.21. There's a lot of issues dealt with in the epistles about this, um, especially Galatians and then uh, Corinthians. All right, so now we're getting into the discussion. We're about to have the Jerusalem Council assembled here. And they're going to look at two things, all right? They're going to look at do Gentiles, or how, basically, how is anyone saved, all right? Is it through grace alone, through faith alone, or is there some other requirements? Do you have to become a Jew first? That's the case they're, they're looking at right here. Um, you know, this could be have wider implications, not only about following the, the law, but also, you know, are, you know, are there any other types of works or anything that are required? And, uh, and then they're also going to take a look at how do we address these issues where we have churches that are Jewish and Gentile. Christ has commanded us. He wants us to be one, right, to have unity. We have to be together. We can't, if we're not, if we, we can't have, you know, the, the Jewish church and the Gentile church, I mean, that's not really, I don't think, how it should be. So they're going to have to address that as well. And basically, you're going to have six arguments laid out. You're going to have three different speeches, six arguments laid out. And, uh, you know, the, basically, it'll be Peter, and then um, it's going to be Paul and Barnabas, and then uh, James. All right. So I'm going to read verses 6 through 11. All right. Then the apostles and the elders were gathered together uh, to consider the matter. And after there had been uh, much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by, the mouth, by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them. Having cleansed their hearts by faith, now, therefore, they are putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear but we believe that we will be saved through grace of the Lord Jesus, that as uh, just as they will. All right. So here we have notice one thing, which is the apostles and the elders came together. All right. Um, they discussed the issue. Uh, they had some some debate about it. But now Peter and the rest of the apostles they come out and they're going to uh, go over their decision. All right. And, they're, and the decision is, they're going to come to is they're going to clarify the way things are. They're not actually saying, like, because we decided, that's how it is, all right? Um, and notice that this was decided amongst elders and apostles. This was not like a, let's have a, the congregation come to the decision or whatever. This was, you know, between them, all right? The apostles, we know, have the authority given to them by Christ uh, to, to go out and, and teach and to settle these sorts of issues. So let's look at uh, what Peter has to say, all right? <clears throat> so he, he brings up the fact that, um, you know, and basically he was sent to the Gentiles already, right? In Acts chapter 10, we talked earlier about Cornelius. He goes to Cornelius, uh, you know, he, he preaches the gospel, Cornelius, his family, his friends that are there, they hear the gospel, they believe, and the same sort of stuff that happened at Pentecost, so that makes me think they're speaking in tongues and stuff, the Holy Spirit comes down on them, 
the same sort of thing they see happen to them. So God has not made any distinction between Gentiles and Jews as far as in regards to the Holy Spirit. Um, and so, you know, when Peter did this, he didn't go to, uh, you know, they received the Holy Spirit. He didn't say you got to be, you know, circumcised first. He didn't say you got to follow all. It just happened, all right? And so he's bringing this up and he's like, look, you know, there wasn't, we didn't put this requirement to them 10 years ago and they believed and they received the Holy Spirit and they're saved. So why would it be any different now? Okay, so he's appealing to God's previous revelation. All right. And there he goes. God knows the heart of men and he knew their hearts. And so the Holy Spirit in the same way, you know, so God knows what their hearts are. God knows whether they believe or not. And he sent the Holy Spirit. All right. So here he is. He's validating their belief. All right. And so he made no distinction. All right. Then you see that the Gentiles' hearts were cleansed by faith. All right. Think of it like this. It's like after they believed, after they received the Holy Spirit, there was a change in their lives. Right. There were fruits of the Spirit. Right. Joy, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All right, these sorts of things resulted from that, right? Then he brings up the point that Gentiles, you know, look, we weren't able, you know, he's bringing up, it's like, our fathers and us, we weren't really able to follow the law. I mean, that's the whole point. Like, we can't measure up, all right? The law was never to justify us, justify us before God. How can we expect them to follow it? You know, even the Jews couldn't keep the law, so that's the, that's kind of the idea. Why put them on it? All right, and he's saying, you know, God's already made these determinations. Why are we trying to put him to the test by trying to refute that? Um, and, of course, he reiterates the fact, he says, uh, you know, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will, right? So he's just restating the fact, we're saved by grace, and they are too, all right? And so to put an extra set of requirements on them to follow the law, that just doesn't make any sense, all right? So, uh, <clears throat> starting in verse 12 here. Uh, and the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name, and with his words, it was written for the prophets just as they agree. All right. Um, actually, I want to <clears throat> stop it. So let me go back to this real quick. Verse 12. So we have Paul and Barnabas get up, and they're saying, look, we went out, we were preaching a gospel of grace, we saw God do all kinds of signs and wonders. We saw miracles. We saw people getting healed. And if we go back, a, you know, a few chapters in Acts, we even had this guy like Bar Jesus or whatever who was like challenge us, and then like boom, like that, he's blind. Okay, so we have God verifying the message. That's the point of miracles. All right, in the Old Testament, you had prophets doing miracles. It verified their message, all right? That's the point. God's putting his stamp of approval on what they're preaching, all right? And so Jesus did the same thing. That's one of the reasons Nicodemus approached Jesus. He's like, look, we see you doing all these miracles. You have to be from God, all right? And so he's, these miracles were done. Paul and Barnabas are preaching a gospel of grace. This is God's approval, all right, of their message. And so you know, he, and then, of course, nobody can really argue with that, all right? But James, in verse 13, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles. So he's going back to Simon, or to Peter, okay, uh, and saying, look, he's, he's already told you how he went first went to the Gentiles, all right, to take from them a people of his name. So God opened the kingdom to the Gentiles. And with this, the words of the prophet agree, just as that is written. All right, verse 16. So uh, uh, James is about to read, uh, quote, a passage uh, from Amos. Okay, it's loosely quoted from the Septuagint, Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. And it says this, After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it. 
that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Okay, so James here is a previ- uh, kind of appealing back to previous revelation, Old Testament. This is viewed to be a prophecy of the millennial kingdom, and in it, it references Gentiles uh, who are called by by Lord called by God, they come in into the kingdom, all right? So here we have another reference that, you know, there's just Gentiles coming into the kingdom. There's no requirement. There's no requirement for circumcision. There's no requirement to follow the law. It's just Gentiles, right? And so, you know, he goes through that, and then we get kind of to him at the end of his defense here. He's going to come to a judgment, all right? He's going to come up and say, all right, so we've dis- we've discussed our arguments, we've discussed our reasoning, now here's what we're going to do about it, all right? And so in verse 19, they come to the decision, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood, for from the ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. All right? So James is basically saying, look, based on the reasons we've given, there's no reason uh, for Gentiles to, follow, to have to follow the law. Okay? They're saved by grace, just like us. We can't follow the law. We are never justified the law. Why are we going to put it on them? And he's going to, you know, they've, they've settled the theological issue. Now they've got to look at the practical issue here with fellowship. And so the Jews are not to expect the Gentiles to follow the ceremonial law, right? If you look at the Old Testament, the law, you know, you get to the, towards the end of Exodus and Leviticus, and you get all these different requirements, right? We do like, you know, you want to read the Bible from beginning to the end. That's where it really starts to <laughs> catch up with you. But, uh, you know, we have these practices that aren't necessarily rela- related to moral issues, okay? And we, we've already kind of talked about those dietary restrictions, um, mixing cl- clothing from different cloths, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so there's no reason to put this on them. But we're going to ask something of the Gentiles as well, okay? We're going to ask them, all right, um, you know, they're living on Christian liberty. They have the liberty to do different things, all right? They're not living, you know, under the Old Testament law, but they have to, they're going to have to work with their brothers and sisters, all right? And Paul deals with this in some of his epistles where, you know, I believe something different than you. Something violates my conscience to do it, then I shouldn't do it, right? These Jews, they believe they should still follow the law, okay? If they, if they make themselves not follow the law anymore, in a, in a sense, it's, it's violating their conscience. They shouldn't do that. That's sin, all right? Gentiles, you need to help your brother out, right? Jesus gave uh, the, the disciples uh, a com- new commandment, right? I give you this new commandment. Love one another, all right? You need to love one another. You need to help them out. We need to come together on this, all right? So, these are the things that the Jewish believers find the most detestable, okay? These are all things associated with idolatry, with pagan worship, all right? And those things would be particularly offensive to them, all right? And so we have uh, this idea that they should abstain from things polluted by idols, all right? This is particularly talking about maybe food. So in pagan worship, it was, it was in idolatry, it was common to sacrifice an animal to a deity. So you'd go to the temple, you got a sheep, you got a goat, you got an ox, you know, they slaughter it. You give a piece of the meat for the offering. Well, what happens to the rest of the animal? Well, you can go sell it, all right? So you got these meat markets set up behind the temples, and you can get your fresh cuts of meat, all right? Well, and this is just really, 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 really offensive to Jews that, wait, that, that was sacrificed to an idol, and Paul would rather, later write in, um, in one of his epistles that, you know, that about the same sort of issue that 
There's not really an idol, okay? It's not really a, a Zeus or a whatever. There's not even a thing, okay? But because it violates their conscience, work with them on this and just don't do it, all right? So, you know, just refrain. And how are you supposed to have a potluck, right? You're going to have people come over and be like, well, that came from Zeus's meat market and that one came from there, so you can't touch that, all right? So here's the idea. Just refrain from this meat sacrifice idols, all right? Refrain from sexual immorality, all right? This would be pretty self-explanatory, all right? In Christian freedom or Christian liberty, you still have, you still need to follow, you know, the, uh, this would be a violation of moral law, okay? But sexual immorality, there was very common practice, different temples, different deities, there would be prostitutes, all right? Priestess at the temple is a prostitute. There would be sexual acts performed as part of the worship of these deities, all right? You also had uh, Gentiles' idea of marriage, very different than the Jewish idea of marriage. Especially in Roman culture, men were not expected to be faithful, right? That was just kind of a thing. You know, you had your kids with your wife and then, you know, whatever else, and there's all kinds of stuff. So this is an idea like, look, this is particularly offensive to them. You need to do this anyway, all right? But just specifically, this is grossly offensive to the Gentiles, I mean, to the Jewish believers. So, yeah, definitely stay away from sexual immorality. And then he, you know, then he also states what has been strangled from, uh, strangled and from blood, all right? So Jewish dietary restrictions, no blood in an animal, all right? When you slaughter an animal, you have to drain all the blood out, all right? Um, pagan worship, idolatry, they may drink blood, they may do all kinds of things with blood, they may strangle animals and eat them with the blood in it, okay? Just don't do that, all right? And you'll notice that all of these things are not particularly burdensome, all right? It wouldn't have to be go that far out of your way, you know, to like, I'm just going to get the meat in the, from the animal that wasn't strangled, or I'm going to, you know, you know, because how are we supposed to have fellowship? Because we all know that fellowship, right, involves gathering around and eating together, and if you have, you know, half the church can't eat this stuff because, you know, it's like, come on, it's, it kind of makes a lot of sense, all right? And then he, he gets a statement here, from ancient generations... Moses has in every city those who proclaimed him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. You're like, what, what does that have to do with this? All right. So I looked into this, and it's, the idea is there are Jews spread all over the, the known world here, and there's still a lot of Jews who are not believers, most of them, in fact. And so the idea is that, look, you ever heard of like, be all things to all people, all right? So if you're a Gentile and you want to share the gospel with a Jew, all right, just make it make yourself a little bit more approachable to them, right? You know, be a little bit less offensive. So if you're still eating this eat sac- meat sacrifice to idols and stuff like that, you could be ruining your witness to Jews, all right? So th- that's just the, the idea behind that. All right. And so they're going to basically come together and put together a letter and send it out to address this issue. <clears throat> so just to kind of recap what, what was going on here, we, we saw where the early church was dealing with the most serious doctrinal issue, right? Um, sometimes we think about some different doctrinal things we deal with today, and, you know, they may or they may not have anything to do with what, how somebody gets saved, right? But when you think about, as far as beliefs go, the doctrine of salvation, how, what does somebody do to get saved? Or can they do anything to be saved? Or is it only the work of God, all right? This idea, it's the most important, and so this is where they have to address it. We have false teachers spreading a false gospel, has to be dealt with. We see how the Jews and the Jewish, the Jewish and the Gentile believers, they're, they're both told to do different things. Don't expect the Gentiles to follow the law. Um, Jewish believers, you know, don't put the, you know, the law on them. Gentile believers, abstain from these things so that we can be united in the church, all right? And then we have kind of this, the settling of the issue, and then they're going to send out a letter, all right? And just, just to kind of, to draw it in here, like, 
How does this apply to us today? I mean, obviously we can see where issues where we may have different views from fellow believers. There may be something we do that causes our brother to stumble, all right? Uh, just, you know, keep that, you know, that's something to keep in mind. A lot of times people think of like, you know, wait, alcohol, is it a sin to drink? No. Is it a sin to be drunk? Yes. Uh, my brother may struggle with that. My sister may struggle with that in Christ. I don't, you know, you don't want to, you know, put them, cause them to stumble, all right? There's things like that. There's other issues. Uh, so you have this idea that we need to come up under, you know, our, our fellow believer and just kind of be there for them, support there. We don't want to cause anyone to stumble, all right? And you have this kind of thing going back with the Jews and the Gentile believers. And then we have the core of issue, right? The core issue they're dealing with here is, you know, this, this legalism, this assault by Satan to introduce false doctrines into the church, right? And we look at it now and you're like, well, you know, I haven't ever run into anybody telling that people they got to, you know, follow the law and stuff like that to get saved. And it's like, that's true. I don't, I mean, there's probably somebody out there doing that, but I don't really know many people. But we still do have the issue of introducing legalism. And what's legalism? It's like, instead of a gospel where, you know, we obey God because we love him, because we're, we, you know, we're obedi- obeying him. You know, Jesus says, if you obey me, you follow my commands, all right? So we love him. We follow his commands versus you need to follow these, uh, uh, you need to follow these commandments. You need to do these things to justify yourself to God, to show how righteous you are. And when we look at every other religious system in the world, all right, for the most part, it's, you know, if there is a God or gods or deity or whatever, we have to come to him. We have to justify ourselves. And so you have these religious systems set up where, you know, maybe it's some practice you have to do, some ritual, some offering. Maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, a ceremony or something. You know, maybe it's you follow the teachings of this person. Maybe you do enough good works, all right? Maybe, you know, you help enough old ladies across the street or do whatever. The, the case is you want to curry favor with God. You want to, you know, earn your, your way, all right? Earn your way to, you know, an eternal life or an afterlife or whatever is do these things, okay? When we look at the gospel, all right, we see that we have a God who's holy, who's just, all right, we're separated from him by sin, okay, and there's no way we can approach him, all right? We, I always think it back to Isaiah chapter 6, you know, when, when Isaiah see, is before God in his throne room, all right, he's like, woe's me, I'm like, I'm undone, I'm disintegrating, I'm falling apart, you know, this idea that there's nothing we can do to earn it, all right? And that's where grace is. Grace is a gift, all right? Our salvation is a gift. And I just want to, and, and just to reiterate, you know, these first believers, they didn't, have, they didn't have the finished New Testament, but it is very clear through Scripture now, the, the gospel, all right, that faith, the, well, the salvation is by grace through faith. And this is was such a huge thing during the Reformation. It's like you have Martin Luther who's living under a religious system where you have to do what? Well, you have to believe, but then you have to be baptized. And then you have confession. You have different sacraments. You have things. You're never justified before God. You, that's something you find out when you die, okay? So, and it's just this, this idea that, when I say justify, what do I mean? So it's a legal pronouncement, all right? And I'm going to read to you a couple of verses here. Close it up. And um, so Romans 5 through 11. Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved uh, by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. 
More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. All right, so through the work of Jesus Christ, we can be reconciled to God. Um, if you look at Ephesians uh, 2, verses 8 through 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not a work of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works. So God's grace doesn't come from a result of works, all right? Uh, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, all right? So works don't justify you. Works are a result of our grace, a result of our gift. It's a result of our love for God, right? So I just want you to think about that. Think about, um, you know, how, what, what do we do about this thing? What do we do? We live in a world where if you ask the average Joe on the street, you know, hey, do you believe there's a God? And like, yeah, probably, whatever. Well, what happens when you die? I was like, well, I've been a bit of a pretty good person, you know. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't, you know, done anything too bad and stuff like that. And so it's man, fallen man's natural position to justify themselves to the deity, right? To say, you know, I'm not as bad as that guy. So, you know, whatever, you know, I think I'm okay. I think I'll be all right. I hope so anyway. And so we live in a world where we face that from the, and then we also live in a world where there are so many false gospels, all right? What's a false gospel? It's when you take truth and you add a falsehood to it. The falsehood overrides the truth, all right? And um, so just the question of, is grace enough? Here Paul says in, um, in Romans 11, verse 6, uh, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace, all right? So if you're having to earn grace, it's not grace. All right. So I just want, as a believer, I think it's important that we understand how important it is, um, the sanctity of the gospel, to be able to go out there and to know that what, what the true gospel is, what it, what it is. Because if somebody's believing in a fall, and there's millions of people around the world that are caught up in, you know, I believe, but I'm doing these things in order to justify myself before God. Right? And that's just, it couldn't be any further from the truth. And it's sad, and, and we find this, you know, in a lot of legalism uh, and cults. We also see it, prosperity gospel is another false gospel we're not going to talk about. But, and then also, like another big heresy today is liberalism. The, the basically discarding God's word, it means what I think it means or what I feel like it does. And, you know, it just kind of morphs to whatever the world's values are. And that being said, I just want, you know, to, to just close us in, in prayer and um, to really ask that, you know, I'm going to pray and, and, you know, the band's going to come up here that we think about the gospel, and if grace is enough, and the fact is, grace is the only way we can be saved, right? And that is the, the key to the gospel. Um, you know, grace through faith. You know, we, we get a free gift from God because of our faith, all right? Or you could even say, God gives us faith so that we get grace, 